We don't talk about money or sex in America. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to The Money Is Show, and I am your host, Andrew, in a totally different outfit, and we'll see if I stay with this style. We'll go back to the suits. Long story. But in the meantime, we got an awesome guest on the show today, uh, Miles Binford, and Miles Binford is uh, right now living out of Florida, Cape Coral, and uh, I'm sorry, not Cape Coral. Uh, that's some real estate that I own. He lives in Clearwater, Florida, which is where I would like to own some real estate. He uh, <laughs> lives in Clearwater, Florida, and uh, runs a company called Equity and Help Ventures, as well as a mortgage company as well down there in Florida. And we're going to bring him on the show today, talk to him about what he's doing, helping underqualified people qualify for loans, as well as working with investors on uh, investing inside of real estate as well. Plus, we'll catch up on the mortgage industry to see what's going on during these times and see if it's a good time for you to get a mortgage right now. Miles, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Glad you came out here, bro. Yeah. Uh, long flight. I've done it before. Florida <laughs> to Utah. Yeah. It's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a long one. Did you have a layover? I did. Yeah. I did. Uh, yeah, Vegas. Vegas. Oh, yeah. who'd you fly with? Uh, well, let's see. Southwest. Southwest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that's what I think is it would have been uh, Vegas to Southwest. Yeah. Uh, I'm in a Delta, so it's freaking Atlanta no matter where I go. Right. And when I lived in Atlanta, it was perfect because I always got off at the main connection piece. And anywhere else, man, it's a, it's a uh, stop, stop. Dude, right. this is so funny. I'm on Scatterbrain right now. It's around Christmas time. Last night I watched a movie, I've seen it before, called Daddy's Home 2. Right. Have you seen it with Mark no. Wahlberg? Hey, I haven't seen and it. And Will Ferrell's <laughs> in it. And anyways, their dad comes home, and he's like this, like, I don't know, just funny, funny guy. And he, they, he flew in, and he talked about his favorite thing to do is to uh, book flights with the most connecting flights, most connecting stops, so he can talk to more people. Okay. I'm like, dude, what the hell? Why would you want the most connecting stops on an airplane ride? I freaking hate connections in airplane rides. Yeah, that was pre-COVID as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure, bro. Right. Uh, for sure. Uh, all right, so let me get some stuff here with you, man. Uh, first of all, I want to back up a little bit. You got a lot of stuff going on. Let's back up a little bit and tell, tell the uh, uh, crowd here, the audience, um, what was it like growing up, Miles? Where'd you grow up at? What type of family life did you have? What was it like growing up? I had a good family, two brothers, three sisters. Where uh, do you fit in at? Well, I'm the youngest by You're the 10 youngest. years. Oh, wow. It was like the Brady Bunch, and then I came. Yeah, yeah, right? like the cousin on the Brady Bunch who came after this show, basically. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, so you were the youngest of four, but 10-year gap. Youngest of, yes, there were five above me. So okay. six, six brothers, or, you know, two brothers, three sisters. So I got you. total of six. Total of six. You yeah. were the youngest out of six, That's right. and, but the youngest by 10 years. Yeah. So uh, part of your probably brothers and sisters were almost a little bit more like mom figure to you. Helping you like, like babysit yeah. and all that type yeah. of stuff, right? Yeah. I, 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 well, my, my, my sister, actually, my, my, my brothers used to take me to their parties. Yeah, yeah. So that I could, you know, all the girls would come in. Oh, they, sure, they for sure, dude. They want to hang out with me and all that. Oh, so, man, that'd yeah. be perfect for the parties, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I was 10 years older. I was the oldest, and I was 10 years older than my youngest sister. Okay. That's why I was asking, because like, I like, kind of babysit her a lot, and there's a different relationship between me and her right. than my other sisters that are a little bit closer in age. It's interesting because... Um, you know, I had a huge family up until I was 10, and then I was yeah. an only child. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, that's yeah, right. Everybody moved away, and then it was just me, and I, it left me with this interesting sort of uh, fear of missing out. Yeah, oh, I so can see I that. So then I got really, uh, you know, mm -hmm. very social after that, and, yeah. you know, it definitely changed uh, my outlook on life. That's uh, a very so unique uh, system there. Did you, yeah. uh, parents, were they entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, nine-to-five jobs? My dad was an educator. So oh, that's he what was mine a triple were. PhD. Okay, mine were not that high. He was one of the deans of Utah State. Mm -hmm. uh, he graduated from Stanford. So, okay. you know, education was the thing. The big thing then, dude. Yeah, exactly. So you grew up in a household. <laughs> you grew up in a house that was that was pushing education. Very much college so, yeah. education. Yeah. Right. Of course, Stanford being one of the best of all time. That's right. Now, due to the age, when I was two, my dad retired. Oh wow! So my parents were retired, which allowed us to move around. Okay. So we were more free. It was almost gotcha. like we we're a military family, but we weren't. Um, so, you know, I, I, <laughs> I was born in Utah. I grew up in Arkansas. Uh -huh. Um, you know, I lived in Florida, spent 20 years in California, California, so Oregon, around. right? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, when you w did, did, uh, I'm going to go to school for a second. Did you, your brother's sisters go to, uh, college, universities, anything? They, most of them did. Yeah. Most of them did. Yeah. Most okay, of them. But what about you? No. <laughs> I mean, I, I went to a junior college. And yeah, like, yeah. You know what? This is not for me. I want to create my own path. And, you know, I was an entrepreneur. I wanted to create well, something. Are your brothers and sisters entrepreneurs? Yes, to a large degree. I always look for connections. Like, yeah. you know, was it child rearing? Was it how they grew up? So some of them are Yeah, and it definitely comes, you know, 
the whole family has their own entrepreneurial spirit. My, uh -huh. my older brother, he actually lives here in Salt Lake. Okay. Uh, he owns a uh, uh, exercise equipment company. Okay. Uh, that's international. Oh wow. Um, so he's definitely. You want to give him a plug right now? What's the name brand of it? You know. Yeah, Fitness First. Fitness First. Yeah. Fitness now, they First. sell equipment. They they sell equipment around the world. Gotcha. Yeah. Fitness First so, Equipment. Yeah. Uh, we might have to get him on the show then. Yeah, for uh, sure. Talk about gym and exercise. Yeah. We had a Drew Manning. If you know him from, he does First a Drew, yeah. uh, Fat to Fit. Right. Is that right? Fat to fit to fit? Something like that. It was, it was very humiliating for me because he took his show off, shirt off on the show. Oh. And he's like ripped beyond measure. <laughs> and I did not. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I did not take my shirt off. But uh, okay, so uh, your brother's an entrepreneur. Brother, sisters yeah. kind of all have that little uh, common denominator. They're all self-starters. Yeah, yeah. I just call it that. Like I have a sister that's a, a lawyer. Uh -huh. um, she, you know, she's a well-known lawyer in Arizona. Yeah, I've got another sister. She was uh, the number one modern dancer in the world. Okay. Uh, at at that time, and then now she's a uh, college professor. Yeah. So uh, very just dynamic individuals mm -hmm. in their own way, and we all kind of went our own, own separate routes, yeah. but we found our own routes. And, That's cool, man. Yeah. And so you ended up a uh, hardcore entrepreneur. Yeah. You started a handful of different businesses. That's right. Uh, so far, uh, I talked to you about one of them. Uh, that you, you, you're out of it, you don't do it right now, but the uh, rehab center, yeah. which I want to talk to you a little bit about. But just for the viewers right now, um, tell us a little bit about what you do right now, currently in business. Okay, right now, I, as CEO of uh, Equity and Help Ventures, what okay. we do is we buy lots of homes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, a single fund is 100 homes at a time. Okay. So we'll buy those homes with investors. Okay. And then we bring in the families to then buy the homes, you know, from us. Okay. And uh, do, we have a contract, so after three years, we refinance them into a, a better mortgage. Now, the key with these families is that they are underqualified. Right. So I do have a mortgage company. So this is, this is how it marries together. So right. as a mortgage broker myself, I, I noticed that about 50% of the people couldn't qualify for a mortgage. Mm -hmm. That bothered me. So it led me into Equity and Help Ventures to help the, the almost qualified yeah. The underqualified. Right. And by helping them, we can actually help them gain not only home ownership, you know, which is pride of ownership. Yeah, sure. Right. But also some equity in their home. And while at the same time, giving the investors a high rate of return. No, and by investors. So, uh, for example, here, let's say you're going to buy 100 houses at one time, like right. a tape of properties. Sure. Um, you're going to go raise the capital That's from right. a handful of investors, however many mm -hmm. it may be. Uh, they're going to buy these 100 homes at one time. Mm -hmm. Right, that you guys are getting. That's where the investors are coming in. That's to right. That. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, how many houses have you guys on this model right here? Uh, have you guys, have you guys uh, played with so far? Done. We've got just under six hundred right now. Six hundred houses. You guys yeah. are going through the model with. That's right. Um, and we're just launching up. We we plan to be. Uh, we're going to triple in twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one. You guys are trying to triple the model. Yeah. Uh, in the sense of what you have been doing is more of a. I don't want to say beta testing, but it's a beta test. yeah, it's a beta testing yeah. to get all the kinks worked out, That's right. to get all the processes down, the systems put together, right. to be able to scale and grow it uh, to what you need to. Exactly. Because right now, the, I designed this thing for the multifamily investor. Okay. This is the institutional investor. Right. Buying 300 units at a time. Right. You know? So they have a certain uh, criteria that they want in a property, a cap rate, you know, things like that as, as far right. as investments. However, there's a lack of inventory out there. Okay. So, but with apartments. That's right. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of investors, not a lot of inventory. Right. And this is something that's being taught. There's masterminds everywhere. They're, they're teaching mm -hmm. people how to do this. You know, mm -hmm. you've got some well-known figures like Grant Cardone yep. that are doing this. And so I designed this for that type of investor because, you know, we could make the world uh, rent. <laughs> right. But some of these people need to graduate into home ownership. Right. And there is that that margin right there that the current mortgage uh, system that's in place doesn't really benefit everyone. And okay. there isn't a system in place to really help them go from being a renter, getting their finances in order and all of that and pushing them into to where they can become a qualified homeowner. Uh -huh. Right. So we're helping that demographic. We figure there's about, you know, a little over seven million people and homes that's our target market. And I would say that 7 million probably is a always, uh, it's not like, uh, my thought would be, we talk about 7 million people that mm -hmm. are under qualified. Right. I mean, they can't qualify for a loan right now. That's right. But even if, let's just make up a number here and say that you pushed a million through and got them qualified, my opinion would be there would still be another 7 million still in the pot. That's right. Because more people have now become not qualified. That's right. And so it's never, it's really a never ending 7 million people, let's say in your number. It really never goes below seven million in theory. Exactly, and that's the supply and the demand in our business model. Right. Because the supply, we have seven million homes 
that are coming to us, seven million people that are coming to us. Yeah, the homes are there. Right, right. You know, right now we have five thousand homes per month and five thousand people per month that want to buy these homes. Okay. And yet they cannot qualify for a traditional mortgage. Okay. So we bridge that gap. We help them become homeowners first and then qualify for a traditional mortgage. Right. Yeah. What do you mean by being homeowners first? What does that mean? Well, we help them with a land contract so that they can actually buy the home okay. first before qualifying. So we become the bank. Right, right? for so the we first the pro- three years. That's right, for the first three years. And then we refinance them at that point from a, say, 12% interest rate down yeah. to a 4% the going rate at that time. Right. To like an FHA loan. And then they are traditional homeowners. Then we return the investment to our investors and do it again. The, by return the investment, you mean the uh, initial investment that they invest, whatever the number may be. Initial investment may- plus the interest plus, you know, there's, there's a bit of pro- profit built into the, pro- you know, the project. I was going to ask you on the investor side, do they get any return throughout the three years yes. or is it all lump at the end? It's a monthly, it's a monthly, it's a monthly return. Yeah, because okay. they're paying monthly the, to the bank. The, la- to the us. owner, if you will, That's right. is paying on monthly payment and That's then right. you guys are taking that percentage of that, whatever it is. And yeah. paying out to back to the bank, if you will, the investor. That's right. Yeah. And then they get on the back end after three years, or when that person refines. Let me ask you that question. Mm-hmm. Can the can you refinance the person anytime throughout the process, or does it have to be at three years? Three years is our target. Okay. We can refinance them after twelve months. Okay. So, but typically, a lot of these people are they're completely fine with the you know the time frame. They have agreed to the three years. But if they want to refinance sooner, or they they have a change of circumstance, we can actually help them. Um, tell me about why and where did you come up with this idea from Equity and Help Ventures? I mean, it's kind of a unique uh, process. Not, <laughs> I, I interview a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, I don't know anybody who's doing this one. Right. Where did, it, where did the idea com- come from? Well, being an entrepreneur, I look for opportunities. Yeah, right? you have to, man. Yeah. And I tend to solve painful problems. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is a painful problem for a lot of people. A lot yeah, of true. So it's there. It's there to be handled and no one's really handling it. Yeah. So. As a mortgage broker, I have a mortgage company. We're right. doing mortgages all day long. I get leads coming in. Right. I have to throw away about half of them right. because they don't qualify. And so that bothered me. The other aspect of it is I met Ivan Anz, who is an entrepreneur himself, okay. who started Equity and Help. Equity and Help is an investment just like Equity and Help Ventures, except it's a 20-year term for the smaller investor who wants to buy five or 10 homes. Okay. And then they manage it over a 20-year investment. Uh-huh. So I met him and he showed me a slide. And being in real estate for almost 20 years now, this slide showed a, a very important graph that spoke to me. It's, uh-huh. it's a question I had in my mind. That I knew there was something wrong in real estate. I couldn't figure out what it was, but the slide told me what it was. In the last 50 years, okay. Income has not risen to the degree that home prices have. Okay. So the middle class from the 1950s with the family and mm-hmm. the, the, the guy that would go to work and come home to his wife and she, mm-hmm. you know, the, the pictures from that time period doesn't exist today. That was the middle class then. Mm-hmm. Today it's the working poor. Yep. Yep. Okay. So today you've got the husband and wife both working, sometimes six days a week. Yep. In credit card debt because debt is very easy to acquire, which wasn't back then. Mm-hmm. Okay. Home prices are you know, I don't know how many times more than they were, mm-hmm. but that's a big Inflation. problem. Inflation and the whole thing. Change the whole value of the dollar, right? Right. So now we're, we're taking, uh, we're, we got to reverse something. We got to change something mm-hmm. there. Uh, it can't go on forever. It's, it's pushing home ownership out of the range for half of Americans at this point. Right, right. Where's it going to be in another 20 years? It is a cool, I love, obviously, money is show. I love studying money, uh, teaching about money and so forth. And I used to teach this concept, uh, it goes along with what you're talking about there, how basically in middle class, how that gap is just getting further and further apart. And mm-hmm. we're really, there's really a dying breed of middle class. And it goes to what you're saying. Like if you go back to like the 50s and 60s, mm-hmm. what a basically average salary could provide for a family right. um, was enough to basically have a house and have a car and uh, uh, the, the, a lot of times the wife would stay home and be a, a full-time mom and, and wife. And, um, and then as every decade, they basically were saying in this illustration, was that to be able to stay middle class, yeah. something had to give. Right. It was, because um, income, salary, right. did not keep up with uh, the economy. Uh, of what, what was growing. And then, of course, you had the inflation of the 80s and so forth. But it was like, and I forget what it was, but it was like, uh, say like in the 70s, uh, it was um, to be able to keep up with the middle income family, which is the house, the right. car, right? The, mm-hmm. the vacation once a year, the, this right. your typical middle class family. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like in the 70s, they had to give up um, 
Uh, maybe it was like two, both of them got a job in the 70s. The mom and dad both got jobs, right? right? And then it was like in the 80s, um, the uh, savings stopped. Uh, like they, they, they used to be they put money in checking and savings. It's right. like who really has savings accounts uh, at the bank really? It's like a right. foreign concept almost now. And so they stopped putting money in savings. They had to spend that money to keep up with it. And then it was um, credit was like in the 90s. They had to have credit just to be able to keep up with That's right. this process. And then in the like 2000 uh, era, that decade, it was like, uh, the 401ks started to suffer. Mm -hmm. And they could not keep contributing to the 401ks to be right. able to keep up with their bills over here. And it's basically just showing that the gap, right. what you're talking about, is spreading further and further and further apart. And probably one of those next dec the next decade may be the housing like you're talking about, where they just can't afford it anymore. Exactly. And, you know, there's a couple other aspects that happen in that time frame. We're talking about the families. Yeah, yeah. But what about the companies? The companies right. had to stop their pensions. Yeah, you right. Know, <laughs> You know, back then in the 50s and 60s, you worked at a company for life. Yep, 30 years, 25 yeah, years. 25 yep. years. You put in your time, you, uh -huh. you got rewarded for it. When does that happen now? Companies don't last. Uh, they don't have pensions either. Right. They only have pensions with the government. Right. Because somehow they have unlimited money of my taxes, which is probably for a different show. <laughs> However, um, yeah, so the, the whole industry is kind of, kind of uh, or, or money side is always changing and growing mm -hmm. there. Um, you guys are now kind of going after that. You call it the 5%. Um, yeah, five percent. Define that five percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the underqualified. Yeah, I, I would define those as uh, people that have had maybe a uh, a credit event or an income issue. Like, let's say they lost their job because of COVID. Okay. And um, because of that, they maybe had a few lates on their credit card and, and things like that, uh -huh. where they can't actually qualify, but they're close enough. Yeah. yeah. Right. The credit score might be sub six hundred, but not four hundred. Okay. Right. They might have had a bankruptcy, and even bankruptcy we can handle. Right, right. Uh, so a lot of these things are, are solvable, but for the average person, they're like, I don't know what to do. I mean, my credit's terrible. I'm going to rent forever, and I could never be a homeowner. And they don't have any guidance. Right, right. We're trying to give those people hope yeah. and, and a way to become a homeowner and say, okay, good. We trust that you're going to work for it. We're going to work with you. We're yeah. going to educate you on your finances. We're going to help you with you know uh, your credit repair and we're gonna help you become qualified and then we're gonna refinance you into a traditional mortgage. And from that, you get the pride of ownership. Right. right. So they, they fix up their home. They make sure that it's worth it's they're not worth a the tenant. value. They're, they're not, not a, a tenant, tenant, right? They're a homeowner. So they can't call you and say, hey, my toilet's broken, come fix it. No, they, 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 they have to do they it. They have to go do it themselves? Yeah. Okay, which is giving them that ownership, homeownership from year one versus year three. That's right. Okay. But at the point of refinance, we help them out. They're actually getting the property with some equity in it. Yeah, so when they refinance out of this property, yeah. um, and is that part of the strategy that you have them refinance versus purchase? Because it's a little bit yeah. easier to refinance? It's a little bit easier to refinance, and um, it, it's just the way we can legally do that to make it, make it more straightforward. Um, yeah. So then they refinance out of it, and you're, you're leaving them whatever, X amount of dollars yeah. in the property for equity. That's right. So they so are building their net worth, basically. Yeah. And they're buying a home. That's and right. uniquely enough, we uh, talk about this, is that a lot of times when they actually buy that home, their more their rent their monthly, let's call it rent mortgage whatever we call it goes down. That's right. Not up. That's right. Which a lot of people don't understand that. That yeah. um, I was giving some examples like you may have this house that, that you're renting out for eight hundred, but really the mortgage might have been only three hundred bucks. That's right. Uh, in that area for that type of property, but but their mortgage is actually going to go down after three years. And even with that, it gives our investors a high rate of return. Right. The They've investors who are rent. buying the initial properties. That's right. Yeah. But yet the the their Payment, the mortgage uh -huh. payment, is lower than it would be if they're renting. Where do you find the 100 houses at? Oh, all over the eastern United States right now. So your eastern United States, is that from yeah. like Maine to Florida? Or is Basically. it more southeast? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah, Maine to Florida, okay, so about Texas Maine to, Florida. to, you know. Texas to Florida going yeah. east Arkansas, side. Arkansas, Illinois, Michigan. Okay, so you get Midwest yeah. too? Yeah, exactly. Uh, are you buying them um, like from a fund, from HUD, from a large uh, uh, institute? Or is it one-off homes you're trying to buy? No, no, no. It's, it's, it, we have a feeder line of homes that come over from banks and, you know, foreclosed properties, et cetera. Okay. So we, we have these, uh, you know, we have a steady stream of them. Okay. So, and we get to pick and choose. We look at the property, we inspect them, we make sure it's, they're good. Do you think with uh, COVID, I was just talking about this yesterday in a webinar I was going through, uh, with COVID and the amount of forbearance mm -hmm. that's out there. I don't know if you saw it or not, but I was just reading an article that said, like, if I'm memory serves right, it was like 20 million homes in America are in forbearance right now. Right. Um, which is... Which is crazy mm -hmm. because I think in the last crash, a 2008-9 yeah. era crash, 
Um, we, if I'm, again, don't hold me to this, but if my memory serves you right, there was like seven million foreclosures or something like that right. in the eight nine crash, mm -hmm. something along those numbers there. And let's just say that was those are accurate for sake of this conversation. If eight million homes is what put us in a two thousand eight nine crash right. of foreclosures, and right now we're sitting on twenty million plus homes in forbearance right now. Um, not saying that all twenty million are going to go into foreclosure, right? right? But a good, a good, unless they rework something out, a good chunk of those may end up in foreclosure. There's a chunk of them that will, but there's a falsehood on the statistic. Okay. And that falsehood comes from, they made it too easy to go into for, forbearance. Sure, like, yeah, sure pick up the phone. I'll, I'll skip some payments, it's yeah. easy. One document and that, that's all yeah, there is it to it. Yeah, it's easy, yeah. Sure, it's easy to save that money, that monthly payment because it's a hefty monthly payment. Right. It's a, you know, a $300,000 home, they're looking at a $2,000 payment, so they can save that for the, you know, three months. Sure, too easy. Right. So the ones that really needed it okay. are probably a small percentage of that total amount, probably. Okay, I got what you're saying. You're yeah. saying because the forbearance, I say there's 20 million people there. Yeah, yeah but I'm going to make up a number here. Yeah. But out of the 20 million, 10 million did not actually need it. It was just you could pick up the phone, call your bank, uh, mortgage holder, That's right. and they would send you literally like a one-page document that mm -hmm. said, I need help during COVID, whatever it was, yeah. sign it and send it back and they gave you forbearance right. for a certain amount of time. Fannie however Mae long made it was. that easy for, you know, for the right reasons. Right, right. They made that easy because it was gonna happen, it was a temporary event. Right. It was a, it was a very, nobody knew what was gonna happen with COVID. Right. You know, is it terrible, is it this whole thing? You know, st statistics tell the tale. But, um, you know, they made it easy, but the bank said, hey, you can skip payments and give us a call and it was a, it was a way to service the client and yeah. kind of keep things going. And then regulation came out um, stating, you know, what would it take to refinance? Because here's the deal, if you skip a mortgage payment, right. you have to wait 12 months before you can refinance. Okay. It keeps all of those people- Even in forbearance? Yeah. Okay. It keeps all of those people as clients not refinancing in the lowest rates in history. Right, right. So they don't lose that off their books. Okay. okay. So that's one aspect of it. But they came back and said, you can refinance in three months. You know, three months of on-time payments, you can refinance, you're fine with that. Okay. Or if you pay it all back immediately, you can exit for forbearance and then you can refinance. Okay. So I have a steady stream of business right now saying, hey, did you know you can refinance to these great rates even though you were in for forbearance? Right. You know, it's easy business for me because I just promote On it. The mortgage like, oh, I didn't know I could do that because people don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you don't think there'll be a, a massive amount wave of potential foreclosures uh, that people are maybe talking about that could happen? I think there's going to be a demographic of foreclosures. Okay. There's going to be in the price range of say 150 to 300,000. Okay. I think that's what's going to get hit. Anybody above that in the price range? I don't think so. I think they had enough reserves already. Okay. You know, I think that they had their finances in order to weather the storm. But those that are the working poor, I think are going to get hit the worst. However, you go below that to where we're looking at our numbers stayed strong. Right. We didn't have foreclosures. We didn't have say people say, "Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, forbearance. You know, uh -huh. guys, give me a break. You know, I'm." No. In fact, these were the essential workers. Uh -huh. These are the people that stayed. You know, they paid their bills and they made sure. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a little bit different with equity and health ventures. Because you, your guys' price range is give me a ballpark price range. Price for range for, for ventures, we're, we're talking $50,000 home. 50, so let's just put it in. $65,000. But when they're maybe be all said and done, uh, they may be around the 80, 90,000. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the ARV. Value. Yeah, yeah, so let's just call it, for sake of numbers, 50 to 100K yeah. in this net ballpark right there is where purchase price ARV is all falling into. It's, my point is, it's below the $100,000 to $300,000 range. Right. $300,000 range you're talking about. Right. Those people feel lucky that they have a home. Uh -huh. The people above that, um, I'm just talking in general. Terms. Yeah, broad stroke. Each, yeah, broad stroke. I mean, each area of the country has its own, you know, yeah, economy yeah. And, and price range. I'm just saying, uh, you know, I'm very familiar with the California market. I'm, you know, familiar with Florida, Oregon, California, Nevada, you know, that area, Georgia. So within that. That range there, the one hundred and fifty thousand dollar mark mm -hmm. to two hundred, two hundred and fifty. The finances are not as tight as they should be. They're they're not as good. They're not as yeah. you know dialed in. They don't have the the personal reserves. They don't have money in the bank. Plus, so, uh, I would say in that in that price point right there, one hundred fifty to three hundred thousand. Knowing real estate, like I know real estate and the mortgage, where mortgages have been the last three four years, mm -hmm. uh, that's also the the place where people stretch the furthest. That's right. To buy the biggest amount of home they can buy. 
-hmm. really, not, really not able to afford it or pushing right. to all barriers to afford it. Right. And when stuff like this hits, it, it, they're the, they're, they, they live in the world of paycheck by paycheck. Right. And if not even if COVID hits, if just their job changes and they right. lose a job for a month or two yep. months, they're, they're, in, they're in some pretty hot water. Yeah, they're done. Um, yeah. Because mortgages, like you said, are easier to get. Right. Uh, money right now is easier to borrow. Money like versus the 70s and 80s, right? Like, right. dude, it's just pretty easy to go get money right now, yeah. borrow money. Um, and, be, and mortgages have always, not always, mortgages in the last three or four years have been easier to get right. um, with the different loans they come out with, et cetera. Matter of fact, just on this topic, uh, talking to maybe people that are looking at getting a mortgage right now, I know you run the mortgage company down in Florida, mm -hmm. uh, and that's called Binford? Yeah, Binford Mortgage. Mortgage. My last name, Binford Mortgage. Um, on the mortgage yeah. side of it, just give me some basic, uh, and again, this may be different when the show actually comes out, but just give us some basic uh, uh, talking points right now. What's like the lowest um, credit score someone could have in today's market, and speaking uh -huh. today, again, in the show, it might have changed by the time the show came out, but uh, what would be like the lowest credit score you could get a house for somebody? 580. 580. 580 right now. That's a difficult sell. Okay. As an FHA loan. Okay. They, they've had some credit events, so depending on the scenario, but 580 yeah. is the lowest. 620 is typically where the the bottom mark is, okay. I can go down to 580 with some of my investors. So, so, so. If someone has a 622, pretty straightforward, you can get mm -hmm. a, a loan. Oh, but, now, let me correct that. For a VA loan, you can go lower. There's some COVID changes okay. for during COVID time. But normally, I can actually take a VA loan down to 500. A VA loan to 500. Yeah, yeah. But see, we take care of our veterans. Yeah, yeah. They get the best loans. I'm okay I'm with that. You. Yeah, it's awesome. Doesn't bother me. Yeah. Uh, so VAs, you could, there's programs that go down to 500. Yeah. For somebody who's not a VA, you could possibly go down to 580. Yeah. A credit possibly. score. Yeah. A 620 is, you could See, do a lot no with basically. Yeah, I do that all day long. All, all day long, yeah. 620. But you could go down to 580 with a certain types of investors. And by investors, you mean uh, lenders, bankers, funds that are willing to t buy that paper, right. if you will. Wholesale lenders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That are willing to take over the paper. You could go down to a 580, which right. is sounding very, very similar to, uh, at least in that one category, uh, 03 to 07 uh, credit scores there. Yeah, the difference between then and now yeah. is, you know, you can't do stated income. Right, the you CISA know, loans and Nina, Nina loans are, yeah. are all gone. It's, yeah, nowadays it's Roto-Rooter. You need to have a really good mortgage company and yeah. a really good team to take care of the paperwork because it, everything is checked. Yeah, because right now everything is uh, W-2 verified, tax returns. Yep. Right, bank Perfect. statements. That's right. You pretty much have to do all that stuff. If you're self-employed, a lot, a lot of times you get a CPA letter. Yeah. So you need a CPA, you know, sign, sign off, off on it yeah. for you. And right. uh, what do they call it? The forty-five oh six T. T. Yeah. yeah th that's that right. which is uh, again that was pre-bubble. No one got the forty-five oh six T's, man. No. Uh, just really quick, explain to me what the forty-five oh six T is. Well, you know, there's there's checks that we have to go f go through, and the forty-five oh six T is basically you sign off saying we can get your tax transcripts and. You know, uh, from the IRS. From the IRS. Yeah, not not you from give you. Give us your tax returns, and right, we're like, right. yes, you qualify. Right. Great. Now we're going to get them from the IRS to make sure that there's nothing. These are these incorrect. are verified, legitimate yeah. tax returns. Once Everything you is checked. Yeah, yeah. Your employment's checked. Mm -hmm. Within uh, 48 hours of closing, your employment's checked. Yeah, yeah. They call your employer and say, is he still employed? Yeah. So that's different from the pre. The pre the yeah, freaking the, bubble, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Those were some good days, bro. Yeah, that was uh, the wild west and everything went and, and yeah, yeah. You, know, you know, that whole uh, subprime market was started in Orange County, California, yep. which is where I was living at the time. Yeah. Where I had a couple beach homes. Yeah. That ended up wor being worth, you know, quite a bit less than where they were <laughs> yep. afterwards. And so, now they're probably back up though. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Right, right. Yeah, to the, to the, sure. uh, but see that, that, that pressure because yeah. it, it, all of a sudden my oh, dude. business model was flipping homes that yeah. it was all, you know, it was cake and ice cream up until that happened. And I was like, okay, yeah. that pressure cooker turned me into a better entrepreneur because yep. I had to quickly you know, pivot. And yeah, that's two, a whole nother story. 2007, eight, I got my absolute uh, teeth kicked in. Yeah, uh, I was flipping yeah. uh, subprime, and I thought, dude, I was. I had to be one of the greatest investors of all time. Uh -huh. Little did I know that you know a freaking monkey with one arm could have got a loan. You right. know, I just didn't understand anything that was going on. All I knew was I bought a house, I fixed it up, and everybody yeah. bought it, right? right. And um, and then you realize you're not that good. Right. And my model was completely flawed with a lot of stuff. Uh -huh. And um, but I, I agree with you that during that pressure cooker is when I feel like I became the way better entrepreneur right. because I had to reinvent myself. Yeah. And that's where a lot of times people quit at, right? We talked about this earlier, like, dude, in, in, the, in the Valley, which every, I, I just have not interviewed anybody yet on my show that has not been through the Valley. 
Uh-huh. That's an entrepreneur that starts right. something, that goes and builds something, that creates something. Right. Sooner or later, dude, you get punched in the throat. Yeah. Uh, you get karate chopped right in the mouth, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like, um, but in those times, either we're in two things, obviously you're going to quit yeah. and say, oh, well, I knew this wasn't going to happen, blah, 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 blame it on anything else. Or you shift over and you find a way to uh, grow and, and reinvent yourself. Right. What would you say, some advice to people uh, that in the valley, I'm sure you've been through the valley. Yeah. Um, how do you keep going on that? What's the ingredients? For me, it's in my DNA. Yeah. I mean, I was in the valley. I was at the lowest point you could possibly imagine. Yeah. Luckily, I wasn't into drugs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I was at difference. the lowest point going, where yeah. am I going to put food on the table? Yeah. How am I going to feed my kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that failure and feeling that failure. Yep. Right? So I remember that moment very clearly. Oh, yeah. And that defined me. Yeah. Because at that point, I was looking at it and I go, there's nowhere to go but up. Uh-huh. And from that point, I was like, okay, what's the first step? It's the first step. Yeah, yeah. And then the next step in front of it. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes you don't know where you're going, but it's just, it's one foot after the other looking toward it. But it was in my DNA to, to as an entrepreneur, to solve problems. Yeah. And eventually I would come out of it. Mm-hmm. And eventually I did. I mm-hmm. just didn't know how, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, I think it's so true, man. I think that, um, I think a lot of things, a lot of times people don't realize is, uh, I ask people all the time, you know, is on, are you born with entrepreneurship or can you, you know, create it and build it? Mm. And I, I think my opinion is it's a mixture of both, but mm-hmm. you're for sure born with it. Yeah. And then you can grow and develop more of it right. and nurture it and just like anything else, but you're, you're born with it, in my opinion. Yeah. And um, when you talk about your senior DNA, it's just, it's right. all that you know. Yeah. And in entrepreneurship, it's like, dude, when people ask me how to get to the failure, I'm like, I, I just did it. Like I, right. I don't know, I just kept moving forward. Yeah. Like there wasn't another option, but just keep going. Right. And I think part of it is that it's just, it's just inside of you. It's just that DNA mm-hmm. where other people come and talk to me like, oh man, I would have totally quit. I'm like, <laughs> but where? Like, what would you have done? Like, I don't even know what that means. Like, uh, not that I'm a great person, it's just, I, it's, it's just the DNA side yeah. of moving forward constantly, right. you know? And it took, it, it took at that time, I mean, looking back at that moment going, that was a pretty low point. Oh yeah. You know, for me. Yeah, yeah. But I knew I would come out of it. But yeah. I remember looking at it going, I'm going to learn everything I can from this. Mm-hmm. And then I started to dissect it and mm-hmm. learn from it and, and go, okay, who are my friends? Yeah. Are they really my friends? Right. I because lost a lot. Because some of these guys, <laughs> some of these guys have turned and, and they badmouth me now. Uh-huh. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have those as friends. Okay, who's going to empower me? Who's yep. going to help me? Who's, you know, it's just that Change one your step. network yeah. and little, dude, it's so true. But my wife today, uh-huh. she went through it with me. Okay. And I, I told her at the time, I said, if you make it through me, you know, during this time, you make it through this, we can make it through anything. Yeah. You know, and she did. She goes, and she was the one person, she goes, I fully, fully believe in you. Yeah. She goes, you are way more powerful than you give yourself. Yeah, yeah. Credit for. That's awesome, man. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Dude, she's a keeper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She kept me going. Mine, uh, mine bounced yeah. uh, quick. And uh, I'm not saying it was her fault or anything, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah mine was, my, ours was the opposite, which just adds even more freaking pressure yeah. To it, you know what I mean? I mean, obviously, finances right. affects um, a marriage relationship right. extremely, right? It's like the number one thing for a divorce, yeah. right? Yeah. And you go through that as a young couple, and right. it was just too much for probably both of us. Again, I'm not believing mm-hmm. her, um, but it just adds even more to the problems. And well, my I, first I was wife li- bounced on the way down. Okay, okay, I got gotcha. you. And then you were my recovering. current wife, yes. Yeah, and I got gotcha. you. Then some time passed, and then I, I, I met my current and, wife. But you were still in rebuilding. And I was like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was just like I'm like, uh, you know, you're, you're getting on a bullet train here. I don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. It doesn't look good. I don't have a lot to offer it does, you. <laughs> it doesn't look good right now. Yeah. But you know what? If I can make this much right. and lose that much, right. I can make it again. So yeah. just let's see what happens. And she stuck I with got me you. all the way through. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure, bro. Uh, those are the good because, uh, again, sometimes when you... Um, when you uh, have nothing to offer and you find a relationship and they yeah. love you for that, right. way, way stronger. Oh, yeah. Way more powerful than, yeah. uh, you know, when you have a sh- it's, shit it's to offer, real. right? It's yeah, real. it's real. Yeah. They only, lo- they love you for you, right. not love you for the money or, or advice versa. It goes for men and women that are both successful. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I want to back up for a second because you're talking about just getting through the, through the battle. I want to ask you a question about, I know you started several businesses. Mm-hmm. One of them is this um, kind of rehab center. I'm going to go into that. Before I get to that, let me just ask you some maybe quick advice here for the, the viewers that are watching that are uh, in the point where they want to start a business, right? They're at this yeah. phase where they're like, man, I, I, want, I need to get something going. I want to get something going. I've been wanting to do business for so long or re- investing, whatever it is. Uh, give us a little bit of how to, uh, in your opinion, 
Um, what, what are some of the things of how, how to start uh, your, first business, your first business or how to start a business? Uh, what are some of the bullet points you could tell them right now? Okay, I'll try to condense it down because this could be a, a good, long, yeah, 24 three day. talk. <laughs> yeah, three-day conference on this. Um, people are paid for really two reasons that I found. Kay. I like to look at common denominators. Yeah, I love it. For doing something they don't want to do Okay. or th things that they can't. So things that de they don't want to do, like mowing the lawn, they'll pay some kid and it's like, hey, I, I don't want to do that. But you're not worth much because okay. they just don't want to do it. They could do it it's themselves. Not, they could do it themselves. They just don't want to. It's just not painful enough. Gotcha. It's, it's like, you know, it, it's fine. I'll pay the kid. It's 10 bucks, whatever. It's not that, there's not a lot of pain Interesting. involved, right? Interesting. But a heart surgeon, Okay. he's going to make a pile of money right. because he can do that one thing that you can save do. a life, right? Uh -huh. So you make a lot more money on things you can't do, Okay. right? Now, let's look at the, the problem with entrepreneurship. Okay. Entrepreneurs, they come up with an idea. They're like, I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to do that or whatever. They fall in love with their own idea. Right. That's the wrong way to go. You're instantly okay. going to go off the cliff with that. So number one, survey the area. Find an area that you might have some familiar, familiarity with and talk to someone. Right. And say, what is your painful problem? Mm -hmm. Look for the pain points that you can solve. Right. And you might find, like, a, say, a dentist, right? Talk to the dentist. Okay, what's the most painful thing in your, your office that is just a tedious thing for you? Mm -hmm. Oh, it might be uh, some piece of software. It might be training someone or it might be something like that. Talk to another dentist. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. You might find common denominators. Right. So if you talk to 10 dentists, you might find a common denominator there. Call up 100 dentists right. and say, look, or you know, send out an email and just say, do you have this common problem? Yes. Okay, good. So then you found something, a pain point that you can solve and you can help make it better for that dentist. Right. Then ask them, what would you pay to solve that problem? Mm. Oh, it might be 50 bucks a month. Mm. It might be 150 bucks a month. It might be uh, a pro just a single product or something like that. They're giving you the idea of what they need. Right, right. Right? So you're finding out what's needed and wanted, and then you can produce and present that. Right. Right? And so from that, solving the painful problem, you, can end, you could end up with 100 clients right off of that. Right. It's a like, good. I'm going to solve this problem for you. It's going to be 300 bucks. I'll charge you 150. Tell you what, I'll make you a lifetime member. Or you know, instead of getting the 150, you do that for the next 10. You say, great. I need 10 grand to develop this. Can you give me 10 grand? I'll give it to you for life. Right. And I will market you all over the place. And maybe, maybe it takes three of those dentists to give you, so you can raise that 10 grand to develop your product. And then you give that that to them for life. And then the rest of them. You charge them, and you right. have a business. But the thing is, you didn't fall in love with it yeah. yourself. Mm -hmm. We blind ourselves uh, as far as our as entrepreneurs. We're like, oh, I'm going to do this. Like I had a great idea, and it, it failed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did. I did. It was a you know a debit card for kids. Okay. You know, I was going to develop this Silicon Valley. You know, develop software and the whole thing. Uh, the problem was about it. it wasn't painful enough uh -huh. for parents. Yeah, yeah. For the kids, it is because they didn't have ability to have digital currency. Right. Right, I was going to add a little Bitcoin in there so that they could transfer money and all that and bypass some of the bank regulations. Uh -huh. But <clears throat> the, for the parents, they're like, yeah, it's fine. I'll give them cash. It wasn't painful for the parents, and they're the buyers. Right, right. So I didn't survey the right buyers yeah. on that. I do. I love the answer because it's so freaking true in the sense of uh, as entrepreneurs, we fall in love with some idea that we come up with right. at nighttime. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I'll wake yep. up with a freaking like, oh, my God, this is so freaking brilliant. Yep. And uh, in reality, it, it always goes back to uh, as an entrepreneur, your, your job is to solve problems. That's right. Uh, you got to go solve problems. Uh -huh. And what you were just describing is how to go solve a problem, yeah. uh, me meaning how to go find the problem. And the uh, more painful it is, yeah. the more you'll be paid for. I love that. I love the, also the concept. I've just never heard it before. Maybe put that way is you get paid off of two things, uh, things that people don't want to do and p right. things that people can't do. That's right. And when you're getting paid for things, uh, I, I'm just looking at my own personal life. When I was paid for things people don't want to do, I got X. Right. But when I had a skill set that someone could not do, they just could not do it. Right. I got paid way, way, way more. Yeah. Uh, because they either wanted that, needed that service, wanted this service, wanted to do that service, uh, and they're willing to pay for it at a way higher rate of pay, like right. not even freaking close right. uh, rate of pay uh, to go accomplish that right there because right. they could not go do it. Like the heart surgeon, right? Heart surgeon, you, brain surgeon. Yeah, you have a heart surgeon. Okay, yeah. if, if my wife needed heart surgery, I cannot go d operate on her. Right. Like I don't know how to do that. Right. Uh, therefore, how much do I pay for it? Well, mm -hmm. a freaking lot. 
right. because that's that's what they're going to charge me for it, and I don't have another option. Right. Versus that landscaper on the other side of it, what I don't want to do, I could go cut grass. I just don't want to cut my yard. Right. Um, I would I'm only willing to pay you a certain amount because it doesn't hurt me that bad. Right. That's a great analogy, yeah. really good analogy of how an entrepreneur can look at um, pay and then how to solve the problem as well right. versus chasing an idea that they have in their, in their own brain. Right. Uh, talk to me about this rehab center. What was, the, what was the story behind that? Okay, well, it was called Pure Detox yeah. at the time. So this was during the market crash. Okay. I had a beautiful mixed-use building in okay. Laguna Beach, Florida, uh, California okay. that I couldn't do anything with. I couldn't right. flip it. I couldn't sell it. And it was mixed use. And I started looking at it like, what can I do with this building? Yeah. Right? Lo and behold, I was talking to a doctor friend of mine and then talking to uh, some other people around a table. We were having coffee and all that. And they were from a drug rehab. And they were talking about a problem that they had because more and more people were coming in on medical drugs, okay. psychiatric drugs. Okay to the rehab center, which wasn't the problem before. Okay. They were street drugs only, and so they could do a street drug. Street drugs are easy compared to medical drugs. Right. You know, piece of cake. So <clears throat> they were talking about this, this problem, and I, I go, well, I have a facility. I don't know anything about rehab <laughs> or detox yeah. or anything like that, but I know a great doctor that ran one for five years. Okay. So I went and talked to him, and I said, hey, would you mind being the doctor for the facility? Uh -huh. and he goes, yeah, I'll do it. Six months later, we opened. Now that took a lot of research and a lot of effort on my yeah, part, yeah. and then we had, you know, yeah, we eventually we 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 started as a residential detox program uh -huh. under the uh, under the care of a medical physician, state licensed, the whole thing, yeah, done, and we started. It, it was very interesting um, how we started because it was we had like maybe two months of reserves. Okay, it was we had to do it or yeah. it was done. Yeah, yeah, right, and that was the market at that time. It was like crashed. Right. You know, money was scarce. Yeah. Couldn't no borrow it. Loans. Yeah, couldn't yeah. get it. Nope, not happening. Yeah, so we had to make it go right. And the yeah, staff yeah. briefed it, and I, and I said, okay, guys, okay, we're opening on this date. And we opened, and we had our first client. <laughs> uh, can I make you some eggs? I mean, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great, dude. <laughs> you know, and a lot of these guys did have uh, experience, but for the most of us, I never had experience yeah. detoxing anyone, handling the medical side or anything right. like that. I was just like, well, I can make, you know, we can do hotelier. That's pretty simple. Um, you know, and, and we figured it out, and then you know, under the doctor's care, we, we did you know, and, yeah. and state regulation, we figured it out. Within a year, we were well known as being like the premier detox program because nobody was doing what we were doing. No one was focusing on taking people off of medical drugs. Okay, these are all medical opioids, stuff like that. Opioids, that on. Uh, benzodiazepines, uh, uh -huh. you know, psychiatric drugs, uh -huh. but also like, you know, people get onto drugs for two reasons. Okay. Physical pain or hopelessness, okay. right? You can all boil it down. There's lots of different reasons, but it kind of boils down to like a hopelessness, so they end up on street drugs. Right. B or physical pain. So they have an injury, a car crash, or something like that. They right. end up in the hospital. Next thing you know, they're, they're stuck on uh, Vicodin or something like that, killing the pain, and the next thing you know, it's an addiction. Right. That's a very addictive thing. Any opium-based thing is very addictive. Right. So <clears throat> then it gets worse, because then their, their moods change, and uh -huh. they all right, I'm depressed about it. Okay, good. Well, here's a, here's a psych drug. Yeah. Right? And it's a downward spiral. Right. So next thing you know, they end up on five drugs. They go to a rehab, and the rehab's like, we can't handle you. This is not our public. Right, right. Get off the drugs. We'll then rehab your life. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so where do they go? Oftentimes, they would go to a, 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 a hospital. Okay. But a hospital's purpose is not to get people off drugs. They substitute it. Okay. So I saw that as a painful problem that was coming at that time. Mm -hmm. It was a major problem. I go, this is going to blow up. And I, I foresaw, I said, you know, this is going to blow up in Mexico. Uh -huh. Drugs coming across the border because more and more people are going medical drug than street drug. Right. And there was a flow line coming into the U.S. through Mexico of illegal drugs. Of medical illegal drugs. Of, no, just illegal drugs. Okay. And I said, it's going to blow up. We're going to have gang wars down there here in a few years. Okay. Because people are just going to their doctor and getting, you know, put on these drugs you know, uh, the Xanax and the, you know, the various things like that to, to control their depression. Yeah, yeah. When in fact, you know, maybe they had some depression, but uh, possibly they might have malnu malnutrition. Uh -huh. We did a lot with nutrition. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people discount the idea that there's, uh, the vitamins are a vital part of our nutritional, you know, and how our bodies run and how our mood is. Right. And with today's food, it's all processed yeah. and all that. I had a chiropractor friend of mine take an orange off the shelf, had it tested, and had zero vitamin C. No way. Zero vitamin C. And you think you're getting your vitamin C. Of the and so people are eating 
more and more quantity trying to get their yeah. vitamins and nutrition. And they're like, man, I'm always hungry and I'm always eating and they're getting bigger and yeah. unhealthy and depressed and end up on these drugs. Yeah. So I saw that, I said, okay, one small part I can do is I can open this detox program and I can help these people get off these drugs. And with the medical doctor, he's, he was an internist and he was uh, natural medicine as well. So it would give them IV drips and all of that to help their nutrition. Uh -huh. And so at the end of it, they would feel really good. Right. Right. Not just, uh, I just got off drugs, I feel terrible. Right. There is a bit of that, but giving them good nutrition kind of handles that. Yeah, for sure. So. I, mean, I, I told you in my <coughs> office earlier, like I've dropped like 50 pounds. And it's amazing what it's done uh, mentally, emotionally for me. Like, yeah. It's like stuff I never thought of. Right. Uh, totally rearranged um, so much uh, internally uh, for me that, you know, when I, and it was all nutritional based, like I just, yeah. just things that I, uh, bad eating habits, a little bit going off what you're talking about there, I, you know, a lot of times people use food as a coping mechanism, right? right? They get depressed, they get sad, whatever it is. Sure. They lose a big deal, or the contract falls through, whatever it is, right? right. And it's like, dude, they, then they go go and eat a bunch of food or whatever, and it kind of right. gives them that endorphins of feeling good mm -hmm. for a little bit, right? And um, yeah, dude, it was crazy. And as I as I like took back control yeah. of my uh, health, yeah. like, oh, it's like, oh, this is like it, it, a lot of it was literally for me a mental side of it, yeah, where. Of, of me being able to control it. Right. And then once I figured out that I could do it, it, I actually like just thoroughly enjoy it. Like, no, no, I'm in control of what I can't, what I will eat, what I won't eat. That's right. my choice. Right. Um, I don't have to go eat that box of donuts right now just because yeah. they're sitting there. Right. And at our office, I was making this tour yesterday. We have our Monday meetings and uh, we bring in crumble cookies every Monday to the office. Yeah. And yeah. Um, have you ever had one? They're freaking incredible. Amazing. Oh, they're yeah. like 9,000 <laughs> calories. Right. For this. They're great. You should try them. Um, but dude, one of the things I love doing is on Monday, on purpose, not eating them, uh, just because it's like, dude, this is my life. I can choose not to do this. Mm -hmm. And I sit there with, I don't know, there's 20 people in the room. Some do, some don't eat, whatever. Right. But I love that control of me, me doing it. Now, I've also lost weight before. Uh -huh. So I lost 60 pounds once. Okay. And I had the same thing when I could look at something and say no. Uh -huh. And I was like, I can say no. And I, I, feel, I, I conquered it. Yeah, yeah. I feel better uh -huh. about that. I was sure. like, I can say no. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know? It released endorphins for me. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I'm saying, like mentally and emotionally, dude, it was a big deal for me that, that I did not see coming. Yeah. Um, and I always kind of blamed it on being an entrepreneur, having a crazy schedule. I would eat at random times. Just, you know what I mean? Like there's always a way to justify it, right? Right. Um, at the end of the day, it was just like, you just, no, it's your choice. You can right. choose to do what you want to do. And then once I like broke that barrier is when it all changed for me. Yeah. Uh, all the mental side, uh, side of it there. Um, yeah, so the rehab, it made me think that when you talk about the rehab facility, it goes back to what you said a little bit earlier of like just figuring the need out, yeah. uh, which is what you did there. As yeah. you told the story, the I was like, yeah, problem. you just went and figured out what the problem was right. and then find a way to s yeah. use what you had to solve that problem. The more, uh, same the more defined the problem is, yeah. the more the idea will come to you. Uh -huh. the, the idea is right there. If it's well enough defined, yeah. it's, it's almost like the solution. It will just, it, there it is. It's yeah. like, oh, well, that's a simple solution to this painful problem. Most of the time, it's just not defined well enough. Yeah, I yeah. see that you also have that in equity help ventures. That's right. Where you've defined the you def, you have defined the pain, the problem, of of a group, yeah. of uh, people yeah. that are in that. And I totally agree with you. They they are stuck in this world of there is not this clear cut plan uh, when you're not qualified of how to go get qualified. Right. There's really not. And you don't have your advisors. No. You, you don't have your group of, of people that you can trust that will give you good advice. Yeah. And the higher end, uh, you know, for entrepreneurs and as you start to make money, you, you build your, your, your group of people that empower you. Yeah. You don't have that at that, price, at that level. Right. You, you're just kind of making it yep. go right. And right. And you're just trying to figure it out and hope, hopefully you have a bed to sleep in. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things where they, I could easily see that kind of fork in the road there where they turn... Uh, because they didn't get approved, so they immediately turn and, and they kind of stand that uh, thing of uh, lifetime renter, right. uh, which, which, which are out there. And, and right. I've had them at some of my houses before. They're, they were lifetime renters. Mm -hmm. And it's like almost that fork in the road where it's like, no, dude, if you, if you could have went this way. Right. But the, you're, you are right in the sense of there's just not a clear-cut plan that says, hey, mm -hmm. if you're not qualified, go to ABC Business, right. and here's how it works. Right. Um, and I see that a lot of what you're talking about with entrepreneurship. You guys have done that with Equity and Help Ventures. Just out of curiosity, if someone, is that your website as well? What equity is the website? EquityandHelpVentures.com. Yeah, is that the website? And also Equity and Help. So EquityandHelp.com. Yes. And EquityandHelpVentures.com. Two yeah. different sites? Two different sites. Okay. Yeah, two different uh, business models. Uh -huh. Ventures is obviously the, the larger investments. Right. Uh, equity and Help is based off of the smaller investor 
who wants a longer term investment. It's great from a retirement income. You want to put some money away and help 10, you know, uh -huh. have 10 homes and help 10 families. Uh -huh. you know. That's the equity and help. Equityandhelp.com. Uh, yeah. So either one of those they can go to, whether they're, what, what if they're, just out of curiosity, what if they're one of them more from the uh, tenant slash future homeowner? Mm -hmm. Would they go to the same website? Or would they go to a different They can website? go to the same website. Okay. All yeah. right. So they, whether they're investor or homeowner, homeowner, they, same website. That's right. They go to. Yeah. Um, uh, talk to me about where you kind of see uh, Equity and Help Ventures going in the next 2021, 2022, three-year mm. plan here. Well, we're going to triple our size in 2021. Okay. The growth is, is inevitable okay. because the market is wide open for us. Uh -huh. There's, in the multifamily space, there are too many investors and not enough investments. Okay. We have identified and have a system in place to actually help them with their investments, place their money somewhere that they can get the same rate of return. Right. So our growth is unlimited. We're going to go like this. The, it's, it's basically delivering. So we want to make sure that we can deliver a quality product for our investors uh -huh. and have the, the delivery in place. So that's the only thing holding us back. Okay. But you know, the sky's the limit. I mean, I, I think that uh, within a few years, we'll have $100 million investments. After that, you know, within 10 years, we'll probably have a billion dollars of, of investments. Mm -hmm. And I could be completely off on those numbers. It might be way bigger, but it's all sitting there. Yeah, yeah. It's the ready to the go. potential is there, basically. Yeah, and we have the pilot down. Yeah. It's done. In you know, we're, we're showing... 600 beta testers. Yeah, we, we have... Exactly, 600 beta testers. We have all this, the, 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 stas, uh, the statistics for, you know, how, uh, you know, how they're doing during a COVID time. Right. You know, like what happens if? Well, it's actually made us stronger. Right, right. We're actually doing well, whereas other investments are not. Yeah. So we have all of that ready to go. Talk to me, uh, uh, kind of coming to an end here, talk to me about uh, money for a second here. Um, <laughs> obviously, you've been an entrepreneur forever, yeah. uh, business owner forever. <laughs> You're now working with people that are underqualified for loans. Right. What do you see as one of like, the main issues that, uh, maybe we as a country have, or maybe if you just want to be specific and talk about the underqualified have when it comes to just understanding money. Where, where, where's the problem coming from right there, you think? Mm, a big lack of education on money uh -huh. uh, for the lower end, you mm -hmm. know, for people that have never broken free from the, the, the paycheck to paycheck living mm -hmm. to like, how do you become an investor? Man, that's mm -hmm. a chasm. That is a... The Grand Canyon. Yeah, it's there. a Grand Canyon. That's a good word. It's a for Grand it. Canyon. But the second that you really get into it, yeah, and you start to learn, then you get traction, and right. then you grow. Right. And growth is is so much easier. It's it's it, there's a curve to the growth. It's not like, well, I'll, I'll you know I'll put money away and I'll put the same money away for the next thirty or forty years. Right. Right. It doesn't really work like that. You actually end up with exponential growth the second you start to invest in yourself. Right. Right. And you know, money is an interesting thing because you can sit, look at money and say, well. It solves present time problems. Okay. Okay. For the, the people who are paycheck to paycheck or, or mild investors, that's more real to them right. than money buys future. Okay. For an investor, you're buying your future. Okay. You're buying your future condition. Yeah. You're buying your future, um, how you want to be at a certain time. So you're, you're buying that time. Right, right. Right. Of course, you can't buy time, but in a way, you're buying. Well, in a way, you are, though. Yeah, in a right? way, you are. And that condition in the future. So there's a present time aspect of it for those that don't have money. They're just looking at present time. Mm -hmm. They're not really looking at the future. Yeah. So to bridge that gap, we need people out there like the Gary Vaynerchuks and the, you know, the Grant Cardones and the, you know, the, the, the self-help to, to give them that piece of knowledge maybe that they needed. that Maybe it's said one way, mm. and it gives them that inspiration to say, you know what, I'm going to change the way I think about something. And it, it, it helps them make that leap over that Grand Canyon. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because you talk about, and you're 100% right, man, there's such a vast difference, like vast difference vast. between... Scary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say middle-class America. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not saying poor. Right. I'm not saying uh, government assistant. Like I'm not saying yeah. yes, yes, that group as well. Right. But I'm also saying what we refer to as middle class America. Right. That level right there, and then you look at the level of uh, a straight wealthy investor. Mm -hmm. That group of middle class America, which let's say makes up the majority of our nation right now, in what we what loosely is defined as middle class America, to an investor, is a vast. Right. vast difference right. of how they act with money, how they interact with money, what they do with it, what they don't do with it, right. um, how, they, how they use it, how they don't use it. Right. It is a, 
a Grand Canyon times five yeah. difference. It, but you did make a great point. It's not that you got to get from this side all the way to that side, but you do have to get the running go and jump. Yep. And then as you're in the air, which yeah. is the hardest part to do, right. it actually starts working for you. Yeah, build the plane. Yeah, yeah. As, you, as you're going. That's and I know it sounds scary, too. but it, yeah. it is how it works. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it's, mean, it's a crazy thing. And, and I always go back to um, when, you, when you make that jump and leap, um, um, probably one of the most important things is, is finding out, getting your group of people mm-hmm. um, that you are, pl- I'll, I'll use the word, playing the game with, right. with you. That's because right. you, you made a statement earlier, I was thinking, it was, it was not on the same train, but I, uh, a train of thought, but it, it applies to it, where you're talking about um, the underqualified people that you're helping with at Equity and Help Ventures. Um, a lot of it is because they don't have that network. Right. They don't have that person they can go to that understands money and plays the game with them and so forth. Um, and because of that, when I think of the wealthy side, it's yeah. always inside their own network. It's yeah. always they're reaching out to their own people, their own That's friends, right. their own family. Um, that, you know. th- that they network and it's who you know yeah. and it's just that they know a different group of people and uh, man to me in money the, the phrase birds of a feather flock together are right. never more true right. than inside of money um, so our business philosophy is about taking the philanthropist uh-huh. and an investor and marrying mm-hmm. them together to a new term called the philanthropist investor uh, the philanthropist investor one? Uh, yeah, it was actually my business partner. Uh, Ivan Ants. I hope yeah. you guys have bought the website and domain yeah, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, the so it's called all that. Uh, Philanthro mm-hmm. Investor. Philanthro Investor. Okay. Somebody who will invest, of course they want to make money, but with a purpose. Uh-huh. And that purpose is to help in some way. Mm. Money that's just made for money can be empty. Right, it doesn't right. bring happiness. Sure. But when you help somebody and you, you did it and you can do it with making a profit. Right, right. You sleep better at night. Yeah, for sure. You, you feel like you're, you have a purpose in the world. You are giving, you know, you're giving a chance to someone else. You're helping right. another. And that, that is more fulfilling than money alone. Yeah. For sure. I, I love the investor, no, philanthropist. Philanthro investor. In, philanthro investor. Yeah. Um, um, this is a bigger topic here because I always, I always, uh, see what I call it with, um, I, have a, I have a domain called investing with purpose. Uh-huh. Um, but there's another thing I call it. Uh, because it goes along with like socialism for a second, but right. it's, um, uh, gosh, what is it? Um, capitalism, hold on, they come to me. It's like capitalism, the heart, yeah. is another phrase I've heard before, but there's another word here, I'll think of it in a second, okay. that I use a lot well, of. Well, there's another term that's similar to philanthropic investor, because we're bringing in philanthropic investors. They uh-huh. understand they're investing with a purpose. Yeah, yeah. But there's also the philanthropeneur. Philanthropeneur. And if you look at my history, I'm a philanthropeneur, uh-huh. because I look for ways that I can help people. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You know, I've, I've personally helped 500 people I've saved their lives, yeah, yeah. right? They're alive walking around today because we actually saved their life because I know a good handful of these people or more yeah. would be dead today and right. they're alive today because I personally saved their life. I sleep well because yeah. of that. You know, maybe I've yeah. failed in business and I have. You know, I, I've had, uh, like I mentioned, the, the debit card thing. That, that came and went. It was right, like, right. oh, God, that's okay, lesson learned. But I had to learn the lesson and go, how do, how do I get better? Yeah. How can I, how can I succeed next time, right? And that's the, the, the commonality between every entrepreneur, anybody who's made it. Mm-hmm. You know, like I mentioned, the, the Gary Vaynerchuks and the, you know, these great, you know, these guys that are all known. Yeah. They all have the same thing. They say the same thing. You get up again. Right, you right. keep going. You yeah. take that next step. Yeah, I agree, man. Uh, that word came to me. It was called cause capitalism. That's uh, the word I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, and, and it kind of goes along with a little bit of the same theme that, you, that you're talking about there. Yeah. But, it's, but it's capitalism with a cause or capitalism with a heart called capitalism. Right. And... Um, a bigger topic, not for this uh, show here, but a bigger topic is um, if there was less government mandated red tape uh, philosophy in the world, sure. could the private sector of the wealthy actually um, actually help and mm-hmm. create a better ecosystem, if you call it, mm-hmm. um, for, uh, let's just say, our country for now, for yeah. our country? Of course, but think, that would have to be the agreement. There's going to be a group of people that don't do anything. Yeah, of course. And then there's going to be the group of people that want to give back. And there'll be a group right. on the other side that yeah. um, no matter what is given, mm-hmm. uh, uh, they, they won't actually move forward. Right. Uh, they, just like there's a group on this side that say won't give, there's right. a group on this side that will only take. Right. Right. The opposite effect of yeah. it, right? And there's this, then there's these like two other groups that right. said, no, I would totally help and give back. And there's other group over here that says, I would love to get help and I would run with it if I could right. get it, right? Um, but right now there's, a, there's that, like, to me, I think like, the government runs right in between that yeah. sector right there. Yeah. And, and 
uh, you know, when you, to me, it's like, again, this is a different topic, but it's like when you're, if you try to force someone with money to play the game you want them to play, uh, there's too many ways for them to get out of it. And That's they right. don't want, they don't trust you, the, right. meaning they don't trust the government right. to run their money the right way. And I think there's a pretty good track record of the government sucking at running the money Absolutely. the right way. I mean, yeah. all we, we can solve it really quick and just look at national debt. It's very right. easy to solve right. uh, that you suck at running the money. Yeah. I mean, the government, not you. Yeah, the government, um, yeah. Yeah, but I almost think there's, a, that there's like this government blocking it uh -huh. uh, on this side here. And we think sometimes that the government will solve this problem. And to me, it's like, dude, the government's not going to solve that problem. No. Because when Free you try to come in. market capitalism is the only system that has ever created a massive wealth like in the yeah. U.S. Yeah. Everything else, the more socialistic you go, the more destitute and destruction, destruction yeah. you'll see. And, and it's statistics. It's just stats. It's yeah. not emotion. You can hate me. You can, yeah. you can be mad at me. You can do whatever you want right. to do. I'm not emotional about it. It's just like laying out the facts of like, right. dude, this is how it worked. Yeah. Uh, and I will, I will uh, agree and say that I think if there was more calls capitalism that, mm -hmm. or, or uh, in your terminology, uh, philanthro investor yeah. uh, world, that yeah, it could be better. Capitalism in general, I think, could be better. I'm not right. saying capitalism has no negative to it. Right. Um, but in general, in a broad stroke, you're not going to have to convince me there's a better way to go do what we've created here right. uh, than capitalism, free market uh, concept. Um, but God, I just feel like if the government just moved out of the freaking just way, the way, just get away, dude. Yeah. And it's almost like we're trying to, it's almost like I feel like we've shifted this concept to where um, the other side is trying to get the government to go after the wealthy to take it back, and that will never work. I don't care what the happens. The thing is that it, they it are, they're work. uneducated because they don't realize that it's the wealthy, it's the companies that paid most of the taxes. Mm -hmm. They pay yeah. the vast majority of taxes. It's the poorer. They, it's the lack of education, unfortunately. Yeah, for them. agreed. It's just a lack of education yeah. side of it. Right. They could do it. Um, look, I come from that side. Like, yeah. my family is poor. I grew up on like food stamps and WIC as a kid. Like, yeah. uh, but it's another reason why I love the free market. Right. The free market that gave me that shot to go to go do it. Like, that's what gave it to me. It's there. Yeah, it's there. And yeah. and and I'm a, a kind of living proof of you can be broke ass poor growing up, and and I was, and yeah. um, and made it made it to the other side. But dude, it's, don't get me wrong. It's super difficult, super right. hard. I don't want to make it seem like it's not not um, uh, uh, ch comes with challenges. You know, but it's there. It, there there is a statistic on billionaires uh -huh. that are that weren't inherited, uh -huh. that were self made. This you know uh -huh. during their lifetime, and it's a large quantity of them. Yeah, were self made. Yeah, that were self made. Uh -huh. That's available to the poorest of poor. Yep, yep. To become a billionaire, they can do it. And there's it's actually just the dedication, it's the education, it's the... There's yeah. a track record of it happening. Right. Like, you, again, it's you there. can't really deny the facts right. that they were not, and then they are now. Right. Right? And you can go back and track that they were not a billionaire, mm -hmm. and then now they are a billionaire. Unfortunately, the poor feel like, the, you know, you'll get this line like, well, the billionaires are bad, and they're taking all the money and, and things like that. Well, honestly, look at the stats of it. They, they also employ the most amount of people. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's these large companies, and, and they're regulated to, you know, they want people to do well yeah they want them to do well but this idea of being poor it's a it's a broke mentality yeah it really is I just agree. a mentality and and they need to come out of that and say how can i how can i achieve what they have without feeling envious or jealous or or pointed about right the person who's wealthy thinking that they somehow lucked into it and how lucky are they it's like no 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 they worked for it yeah, yeah. guaranteed they worked for it there's going to be a small few that didn't sure those who really made it and they're they're out there. Mm. Look at Grant Cardone. Right. He talks about it all over the place. He was a drug yeah, drug, drug addict. user, drug yeah, yeah. addict. Mm -hmm. He was in bad place. Yeah. And he today has what, one point nine billion Fun, in yeah. assets? I have yeah, yeah. I don't know where he's at today. He's probably t double that. Yeah. He's motivated. Right. You know And he came and from the other side. He came from the other side. Right. Any of these guys that came from the other side, you see them, they're out there, they're 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 not stopping. Right. Agreed. You know? Uh, last question I want to ask you here is, um, I know you're on the mortgage side. Uh, talk to someone uh, that maybe has not bought their first home yet. How would you tell them um, kind of how to buy uh, a home right now? It's a simple step. Step number one, talk to a mortgage broker or your lender or okay. whatever bank. You need to get pre-approved. Okay. Okay. And then you go shopping for a home because only then do you know what you qualify for. A lot of people have the dealership mentality. They want to go test drive cars and go, uh -huh. okay, I like this one, I like this one. Uh, and then they find one they want, and then they go to finance. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's the opposite in the real estate world. You actually want to maybe find a realtor and then, you know, immediately get pre-approved. Uh -huh. So that's really your first step. Uh, you know, also in that time frame, get educated about it. I mean, you do need your tax returns and you, uh -huh. 
put your, your documents together, your employment and things like that, but don't be afraid to ask questions. I've seen it all. I've talked to people that have the strangest finances yeah, yeah. or events. Don't be afraid to talk to somebody and get help. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's up to us. Like I'm a mortgage broker. I deal with people all day long. Right. I help them uh, navigate which is going to be the best solution for them. Right. Right. Trust us to do that. Yeah, I think it's a great, great uh, two points you gave right there. Just very, very direct to the point. Number one, uh, go to the lender first, mortgage broker, whoever you're going to use. Right. Go to them first and get your uh, approvals and start getting your ducks in a row. Because that, to me, is what takes the time right. on buying a house. It's not actually – I know you have those buyers that look for 3,000 houses for nine, 19 months. Yeah. I understand that side of it. But, but yeah. in a broad stroke – um, what's actually going to slow you down and take time is getting all this stuff in a row, That's getting right. your tax returns in a row, getting your uh, bank statements lined up, getting uh, your, how you're getting your down payment. Are you getting it? Are you borrowing right. it from a family member? Are you, you got to put it, you know, does it need to be seasoned in the bank account right now? Because right. you could go out shopping and find this house and then go get it approved and then realize, yeah, you're going to need two more months of letting that money sit in that bank account That's right. before you're ever going to get the house. And that, yeah. that homeowner most likely is not going to sit there for three months waiting for you to get right. uh, seasoned money in the account. So to me, it's like, dude, I think there is a big, big mistake where people go to the agent first right. and go car shopping, if you will, house yep. shopping, um, not knowing what, what they should go do or, right. or even if they're even ready to go do this um, in versus, I always think they should go to the lender first. Yeah, and get always prepared the lender first. because the lender will look at it and say, oh, well, this is, you need to do this first yeah. before you can, you're, you're ready. Yeah. But then there's, there's also solutions. You might, a lot of, I find a lot of people that are buying, like first time home buyers, uh -huh. they stop themselves first before asking. Yeah, yeah, for right? sure. And I like They, the, they yeah, try to figure up. it out when they're not the expert. Talk yeah. to an expert. Yeah. And the expert will say, you know what? You don't have a down payment right now, but there's a down payment assistance program here's for that, you. Here's that works. That you do qualify for. Yep. So we can do that. And let me work with your realtor. Yep. And together, as a team, you get your, your first home. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the litter side of it is, it, this is weird, but this is my opinion. Maybe it's not weird. I think this is actually the truth, but it is my opinion. Yeah. I think the lender is more important than the agent in buying houses. Um, because an agent to me, and, and I had tons of friends who are agents. Yeah. I interviewed an, uh, a, a couple of agents recently. But to me, an agent is there to show you properties, explain to you how, what the house is, how it works, whatever right. it is. But the lender is the one who holds the keys of you getting it or That's not right. getting it. Yeah. Um, the agent has no say on are you approved or not approved. It's right. zero say into how that freaking works right there. That's right. Um, so to me, it's like I would always start with the lender first and yeah. then go to the agent. Right. Uh, through that process right there. Uh, but, it's, uh, but in our industry, it's the other way around. Yeah. Uh, and I would love to change that because I, it, would, it, would, it would solve a lot of yeah. headaches for people uh, through the process there. Last thing I want to do is uh, let me give you some final words of advice here. Okay. Uh, um, if you were to give these some um, final piece of advice here for some of the viewers watching right now that are in the process of starting their business, building their business, uh, what's some final words of advice you'd give? Starting their business? Oh, it's just survive it. <laughs> ah, that's a good one, man. Survive it. Yeah, yeah. Those who make it, you know, uh -huh. it's because like, they survived it. But yeah. it, there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be things that you didn't think of. There, yeah. You know, just one step after the other. Yeah, Eventually yeah. you reach to the top of the mountain. It, it, it's statistics. Yeah. It's, it's logic. It's natural. It follows the, the laws of the, the universe. Mm -hmm. You know. I think you made a good statement uh, when you were talking about it there that I think a lot of people hold them back is they're trying to uh, figure everything out, uh -huh. and you're not going to figure everything out mm -hmm. first. You right. just got to, you, you can figure it out, but you'll figure it out because you're doing it. Right. I think a lot of times in business, people will try to like l figure every last scenario out first. Right. And then like, okay, when I know all this, then I'm going to go start my business. And it, dude, you're never going to start it. it. You, might as well just, so many you might as well just go stay in yeah. your job and, and spend your uh, mental energy somewhere else. Right. Um, where I think uh, part of what you just said is like, dude, you just got to go yeah. and pull the trigger, jump into it. And you will figure it out as you go. I, uh, I most will of the time. add to that. Always ask questions. Yeah, yeah. And don't be afraid to ask questions, yeah. no matter how stupid. Yeah. You know what is different b between us and animals? What's that? We can ask a question. <laughs> we can talk, yeah. A apparently, not, no single animal ever, even the, the, the gorillas the, they can sign, uh -huh. have ever asked a question. Really? That's an interesting point. So my judge of intelligence is yeah. how, how easily can someone ask questions? Mm -hmm. If you can ask questions, you can learn, you can grow. Yeah. Right? Always ask those questions, especially if, as a new entrepreneur. Yeah. It's like, I don't know how to do this. I'm going to wing it. Yeah, yeah. Good. Ask questions about it yep. so that you can wing it better. Unlimited questions, right? Become man. a professional at yeah, what yeah. you're doing. For yeah. sure. You should be a professional question asker. Yeah. Starting off is what you and should be. Th the greatest genius there is is somebody who can ask any question there is. Yeah, yeah. And not be afraid to be wrong. Yep. I love it, man. Yeah. Uh, um, I, man, Miles, I appreciate you coming on the show. 
And uh, we got some more questions for you in the back there. We'll shoot some more stuff with you. But I'm okay. glad you came on the show. Equity Hub Ventures yeah. uh, and Benford Mortgage. Uh, that in Florida is That's the right. mortgage company, but you guys do mortgages all over. Uh, glad you came on the show. If, uh, if they want to reach out to you, hit you up at Equity and Help Ventures. For those watching, appreciate you watching the show. We will see you next week on the Money Is Show. There you go.